which will live in infamy. Hello and welcome to Looking Back with Dick Morris. I'm John Bachman. This week we take a closer look at World War II, the battles, the missions, the revolutionary breakthroughs that defined this period. First, Dick Morris, political analyst and advisor to President Bill Clinton, shows us how President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in Britain got the United States involved in World War II. As the 1930s wore on, it became evident that Hitler was trying to expand all over the world, so was Japan, and that we would ultimately have to get into the war. There was fierce opposition from the American people to entering the war. Uh, we call it isolationism, but it, what it really was was a right-wing feeling of what has the rest of the world got to do with us, and a left-wing feeling that we had been duped into getting into World War I by the armaments industry. Senator Joseph Nye, I believe of Nebraska, held extensive hearings that, about war profiteering and the subsidization of pro-war propaganda by armaments companies, and it fueled a global desire for disarmament and a global distrust of any intervention in world war. And they were right. World War I was a complete waste of time, and the United States should never have gotten involved in it. But World War II was an entirely different story, but people weren't making that kind of a distinction. Roosevelt knew that we had to get into World War II, and he had a secret plan to enable us to do it, to force us to do it. When Japan invaded Manchuria, in retaliation, Roosevelt set up an oil embargo against Japan in 1939. And that embargo was really like Saudi Arabia embargoing oil to the United States in 1973, and it screwed up our economy for almost a decade. And that's really what the United States did to Japan. Back then, we were the supplier of 50, 60, 70 percent of the world's oil and all of Japan's oil. And the Japanese Navy, which ran on oil, understood that it could not expand throughout Asia, as was its goal, as long as America was cutting off oil shipments. So they had to get oil from somewhere. The nearest oil they could get was in the uh, Gulf uh, with Indo South China Sea, uh, with Indonesia and the Philippines. And they had to get into past Java, Java, Borneo, into that area to be able to get the gold. And to do that, they had to go through China, they had to take Britain on in conquering Hong Kong and Singapore, and they knew damn well that if they went to war with Britain, a war with the United States would inevitably follow. So they struck at Pearl Harbor. Roosevelt didn't know they were going to strike Pearl Harbor, but he knew darn well that the policy he was setting in place would force Japan to attack the United States. He thought it would be in the Philippines. In the meantime, the question of giving aid to Britain, especially after the fall of France, came to dominate the political debate in the United States. And Roosevelt carefully, carefully pushed intervention, one step at a time. He said, we need to be prepared. We're not going into war, but we need to be prepared and we need a draft. We know the draft passed by one vote in the House. That's how averse people were to everything. And when he tried to give Britain some destroyers, which they could use to protect their transatlantic shipment, he dressed it up as a destroyers for bases deal where Britain gave us some very valuable naval bases we still have today in return for these destroyers. It was ultimately a good deal for the U.S. and a bad one for Britain, but <coughs> Roosevelt uh, insisted on it because he needed to be able to give an excuse to give the destroyers to Britain. But the real problem Roosevelt had was that Britain was running out of money to buy armaments, and American law was cash and carry. You pay cash and you carry the armaments away in your own boats and Britain was running out of ships and running out of cash. So Roosevelt proposed the Lend-Lease program, where we would basically give them the weapons. The facade, the facade was we would lend it to them, and at the end of the war they would pay us back. Roosevelt had a cute metaphor. He said, if your neighbor's house is on fire, he doesn't want your money, he wants to borrow your hose, and when the fire is extinguished, he'll give you back your hose. And that was the Lend-Lease program. We, of course, never got the bullets and tanks back. But the problem was, how do you get it passed? And the presidential election of 1940 was shaping up to be a election in which the anti-intervention forces, the isolationists, would win. 
uh, the leading candidate for the Republican nomination was Senator Vandenberg, who was an avowed isolationist, and uh, Robert Taft was involved, and it looked like they would have a Republican Party committed to staying out of the war. Then the Brits got a hold of this, and Britain subsidized a massive campaign throughout the United States to defeat Taft and Vandenberg and Dewey, the other guy, Republican, and nominate a guy named Wendell Wilkie instead for president. Wilkie was a harmless utility executive from Indiana, but was pro-intervention. He was internationalist. And all of the British propaganda outlets got together and funded this movement for Dewey. And uh, the Herald Tribune, was, uh, which was always internationalist and liberal, was bought off and became really the center of advocacy for change in the Republican Party. And it was the most incredible thing. Uh, without anyone understanding what was going on, with time and life and uh, the uh, magazine's look and the Herald Tribune and the New York Times, the whole establishment pushing for Wilkie and against the traditional Republican candidates, they succeeded in upending the Republican Party in the primaries and nominating Wilkie on an internationalist platform. Uh, it was just an incredible coup uh, fascinating, well worth reading. Wilkie lost the election to FDR, which was fine. Roosevelt pretended he didn't want to run for a third term, but had to be drafted into running because of the war, and he was <clears throat> like a soldier doing his duty. But with Wilkie running, it was clear that either way, we were on course to getting involved in World War II. And when we return, how Britain got the upper hand on Germany after it looked like a German invasion of England was imminent. will live in infamy. Thanks for staying with us. Right now we want to focus on how the British government was able to outsmart Germany at their own game. Here's Dick Morris with more on that chapter in this story. The British, from the very early days of the war, were able to break the German code. The German code was called the Enigma Code. And it was very hard to break because it had a different key letter every single day. And people were able to decipher the code, but it would take three weeks of calculations to figure out what the code had been three weeks ago. And by that time, it had changed 21 times because they had a new key letter or base letter every single day. So the British needed to develop a way to make these computations very quickly and they invented a computer. That's why the word computer exists. It was to compute the uh, code so that you could figure out what was the key letter the Germans were using. And once the British broke the Enigma code, it gave them a weapon that was probably the most important element in our ability to defeat Germany, certainly aside from the US industrial production. The early usage of this code was to stop German spies from entering Britain. And then once they were there, to operate them by British intelligence. The British would literally sit back there and wait until the German intelligence telegraphed their agents in Britain that were sending another spy over. And the, German, the British would wait, and when the spy landed, they would pounce on him, arrest him, take him to prison where all the other German spies were, and then assign an intelligence agent to be that German spy. And the Brit every, at the end of every German spy, there was a British uh, intelligence officer operating the spy system on behalf of the German. And with that, the entire German operations became transparent. The most immediate military effect of this was to win the Battle of the Atlantic. Uh, in 1939, 1940, and into 41, Britain was losing the Battle of the Atlantic. More tonnage was being sunk every month than was being built. And Britain was running out of merchant ships. That's why they needed those destroyers from the United States that they sold bases for. Well, after the Enigma Code was broken, we knew where every single German submarine was. Uh, the problem was we couldn't just use the code as the way of finding where they were because 
the Germans would understand that we'd broken the code. So we had to route convoys deliberately over wolf packs of submarines and then discover the wolf pack visually and then pounce on it and destroy it. And by 42 and 43, the submarine had been neutralized as a weapon and Britain's trade routes with the United States were wide open. The next use of the Enigma code was the time it wasn't used. During the Battle of Britain, when Germany sent bombers over British cities and devastated them, killing 50,000 British, largely civilians, uh, in these bombing raids, that's the equivalent of the U.S. death toll in Vietnam, the British picked up information that the Germans were going to bomb the city of Coventry. And the German intelligence asked the, its agents in Britain to light the way to Coventry so that even with the blackouts, their bombers could find it and destroy it. So Churchill had a really tough decision to make. Would he warn the residents of Coventry, in which case Germany would know we knew about it, uh, and evacuate the city? Uh, would he lead them to a false place, at which point the Germans would read that the bombing, that there hadn't been a bombing in Coventry, there wouldn't be any headlines about that, and they would again understand that the system was broken? Or should he allow Coventry to be bombed? And he felt he had no choice, and he allowed it to be bombed, and thousands of people were killed while the prime minister sat by in anguish uh, because he couldn't compromise the fact that we knew the code. The breaking of this code was particularly crucial during the Battle of Normandy uh, at D after D-Day. Uh, it was a crucial element in deceiving the Germans into believing the attacks were coming at Pas de Calais and then into deceiving Hitler into believing that the attacks on Normandy were just a feint, so that he never released the armor that was under the control of uh, von Rundstadt uh, back near the French-German border, never released those panzer units. And for three weeks, the Allies did not face any German, many significant panzer opposition on the Normandy beaches and in the areas adjacent to them. The system backfired, interestingly enough, when Hitler began to realize something was wrong, and in December of 1944, he launched the Battle of the Bulge, which took the Allies completely by surprise because the Germans cut off all radio traffic. There was total radio silence as the troops were positioned for the breakout, and Eisenhower had become so dependent on the intercepts, they were called ultra-intercepts, that when he didn't get any warning, he assumed nothing was happening. And then the Germans broke through and almost had a significant success. They ran out of fuel and the stiff resistance around Bastogne and Patton's dash to relieve it uh, frustrated them, but they almost pulled it off. So that story of the double cross system did not become public until the late 1960s. And then there's a human tragedy. The guy who made all of this possible was Alan Turing, T-U-R-I-N-G. He's the guy who invented the computer, and uh, he did so in secret. Uh, nobody knew about him because we couldn't, they couldn't reveal his existence. And after the war, he got the ultimate decoration that the British can award for his work in doing that, but it was secret. And he happened to be gay. And in 1946, the British cops raided his apartment and found him uh, having sex with another adult, a consenting male adult. They arrested him, and he committed suicide, and that brain was lost to civilization because of that law. Anyway, despite the tragedy, what a triumph the ultra-intercepts ultra were. Indeed, many tough choices had to be made to secure the proper outcome of the war. Now, when we return, how geopolitics played a role in the decision to invade France. which will live in infamy. Welcome back. Of course, many of us are familiar with the results of the D-Day invasion, but did you know that President Roosevelt's initial decision to invade France was discouraged by Winston Churchill? Dick Morris has more on why Churchill wanted to wait. After the Germans conquered France and the United States entered the war, uh, a series of ongoing political maneuvers happened between Roosevelt and Churchill 
that led to the decision that led to Normandy and the D-Day invasion. The, when, the, when the United States entered the war, obviously our focus was the Pacific because we had been attacked by Japan. We had not been attacked by Germany. In fact, the only reason we got into a war with Germany was that two days after Pearl Harbor, they declared war on us for some god unknown reason. Uh, they felt an alliance with Japan, uh, but that was the worst decision Hitler ever made. Uh, if he had not declared war on the United States, Roosevelt would have a tough time explaining to the American people why an attack on Pearl Harbor necessitated our fighting with Adolf Hitler. But in any case, they did. And initially, the American resolve was to focus on the Pacific. But Roosevelt was very, very sympathetic to Britain, very antagonistic to Hitler. And he eventually brought the American people around to the Europe first strategy. Um, there was some pain for that because MacArthur had to surrender the Philippines. And uh, we were, and, and obviously American antipathy to Japan was at an all time high because of Pearl Harbor. But Roosevelt insisted. But then he went to Churchill and he said, hey, I've done a sales job on my people and they've agreed that we should take care of the West, the, the, the Atlantic theater first. But we gotta do something. I can't just say, hey, in three years we're gonna invade Europe and you know take it easy in the meantime. Uh, it's hard to justify the taxes, the rearmament, and frankly, the inactivity. So Roosevelt and Churchill agreed to invade North Africa in what was called Operation Torch, which was really an invasion of Morocco where there weren't any Germans, but there were French and the French were uh, allied with the Germans at that point tentatively because Germany was occupying France. Uh, and eventually it led to the first American engagement with the, with the Germans and originally that was a disaster but then we learned how to fight. Um, we conquered North Africa and the question was what to do then? Stalin was pressing for an invasion of France and so was Roosevelt. Uh, Churchill opposed it. Uh, he said that the reason he opposed it was that he had visions of World War I with these massive casualties and he was not willing to risk it and it was premature to do that invasion. And as a result of Churchill's insistence, we invaded Sicily and then Italy and it wasn't until 1944, three years after entering the war, that we invaded France through Normandy. But what was really going on was some geopolitics. FDR was focused on defeating Hitler and winning World War II. Churchill was looking past that and saying, what happens when the Soviet Union confronts Britain and the United States and the West? What's going to happen in Europe? And Churchill's game was, let's invade from the South. He said it was the soft underbelly of the Axis. It wasn't. Italy was a very difficult country to conquer, and an invasion in Greece or something would have been very hard as well. But his concept was, go into Eastern Europe, tie up Eastern Europe so that when the Russians pushed the Germans back, we already had control over Romania, Bulgaria, the Balkans, and maybe up even so far as Poland. Then the, but FDR wouldn't listen to that. He said, no, the important thing is defeating Hitler, and the important thing is getting the Russians' assistance as soon as possible by having a second front, they called it, in France, to draw German soldiers off the Russian front where most of the fighting was taking place. And thus the decision was made to land in Normandy. There was one other episode called the Dieppe invasion. Uh, the town of Dieppe in France was chosen because there was a question of whether the Allies could, needed to conquer a port when they invaded or could they just land on the beach. And the F obviously would be better if they conquered a, a city, a port. So they chose Dieppe and they chose the Canadian Army to give it a try. And two Canadian divisions landed in Dieppe and were massacred. It was an unbelievable wipeout. They had to be pulled off the beach. There were very heavy casualties and recriminations between Canada and the U.S. and Britain. Uh, but we learned then that we had to land on a beach. And then the planning focused on landing on one of the beaches in France. Well, it's hard to think what would have happened if the invasion was not successful. When we return, did Eisenhower prolong the war? They think we will live in infinity.
will live in infamy. Welcome back to Looking Back with Dick Morris. I'm John Bachman. Next, Dick explores the controversial theory that some say Eisenhower made decisions that actually prolonged the war. A revisionist interpretation of Eisenhower's role in World War II. Uh, I'm just reading about it in a book, a biography of Eisenhower, a public written by Gene Smith, who was a very accomplished biographer, wrote a bio of FDR, I think one of Herbert Hoover and a couple of others. And he makes the case very different from what other people say about what went on on D-Day and later. First of all, he says that the disaster at Omaha Beach was in part caused by mistakes that General Bradley, the commander of Omaha, made. Uh, that the bombardment, which at the other beaches was four hours, was only 45 minutes at Omaha. Uh, and that the sh landing craft was let off the ship uh, a third further offshore than it should have been. And as a result, it floundered, a great many drowned, and a great many men that got there were washed out and exhausted at the time that they hit the beaches. He also says, more significantly, the theory had been that Montgomery had wanted to do a dash to Berlin. In other words, we broke out of the Normandy area and quickly moved throughout France. And then the question became, what we do in our attack into Germany? Montgomery was in the north, Bradley and Patton with the Americans in the south. Montgomery was the British commander. Now, Montgomery wanted all the resources to go to him and make a dash across the north to get to Berlin. And Eisenhower instead chose to attack on a broad front with both the Brits and the Americans advancing simultaneously. And Montgomery argued against it. And Gene Smith says it was a huge mistake to do it the way Eisenhower did it. First of all, he said, we didn't have the logistics to sustain a long front. And as a result, they were constantly running out of gas and having to stop. He says that had Montgomery been given the go-ahead to move quickly into Germany, rather than wait for the rest of the battle line to form up, he could have ended the war by Christmas of 1944. Uh, we, instead, it didn't end until May of 1945. And two-thirds of the casualties the US troops sustained in Europe after D-Day came in the final months when we were stalled trying to cross the Rhine and get into Germany. He also says the Battle of the Bulge, the Ardennes offensive of the German army, would never have happened because Montgomery would have punched through in the north, taken Berlin, and ended the war. He also says that we would have liberated a great deal of Eastern Europe, that we probably could have gotten to Warsaw, and a great deal of the Iron Curtain would never have really been. And finally, and most horrifically, he makes the point that when you look at the percentage of Jews who were killed in those final five or six months of the war, it's a huge percentage of the total, something like a quarter. And those lives perhaps could have been saved. So, you know, history is really an opinion of what happened. It's not the facts, it's an opinion about the facts. And until now, everybody said, oh, Montgomery was just being a chauvinist. He wanted the Brits to conquer Berlin. He wanted all the glory for himself uh, and, and all of that. But it appears that maybe he was right. And uh, there's a lot of evidence for that. Brooke, the British uh, general chaff, staff chairman, and Churchill both felt that way. And it really hasn't been reflected in histories. And this book by Smith really gets to it. And when we come right back, Dick Morris shares more stories on World War II. A thing which will live in infamy. A thing which will live in infamy. The United States knew that in order to win the war, they had to make frugal decisions to enhance the economy. Dick Morris shows how that was accomplished. Crucial moment in American economic history. We had come off the Great Depression, and the economy had never really recovered. And Roosevelt had inserted a whole variety of statist solutions, uh, including public works and uh, price fixing at the federal level and huge agricultural subsidies to try to make up for the bad economic performance, and they really hadn't worked. They'd offered relief, but no recovery. 
So the question was, when these massive flow of new orders came in, in World War II, would they be handled by the government, as they basically were in World War I, or by the private sector, as they ended up being in World War II? And FDR, to his credit, and over Eleanor's opposition, brought in Knudsen from General Motors, who had been the CEO, not from General Motors, from Ford, uh, who had been the CEO installed by Henry Ford, and who had then gone over to General Motors. And Knudsen set up this massive mobilization, a uh, gigantic mobilization, to convert the entire economy from butter to guns. Uh, consumer goods became virtually unavailable and no automobiles or refrigerators or any of that stuff was made, and instead it all went into war production. And essentially, Knudsen told industries, uh, do this on a cost-plus basis, make as much money as you want. Uh, I mean, he limited it somewhat, but there was a lot of profiteering that went on. Just produce the stuff, have it come off those assembly lines and in time for our troops to use it. And the result was this incredible, gigantic expansion uh, of our military capability. Uh, in the final year of the war, for the last full year, 1945, Germany produced something like 12,000 airplanes, Britain 7 or 8,000, Russia 7 or 8,000, and the United States 125,000, just to give you a sense of the order of magnitude of what we're talking about. We would produce one Liberty ship a day and then several ships a day uh, as we ramped up this capability. And this completely brought about the recovery of the American economy. And it set up the private sector in the US as a vibrant, vigorous entity that took off roaring into the post-war era and set up the prosperity of the 40s and the 50s and into the 60s, set up the whole post-war dominance of the American economy. And it all originated in Franklin Roosevelt's decision to reverse the liberal dogma of a lifetime and turn the task of war production over to the private sector. Now, the other thing that's interesting about it is how we paid for the war. We paid for the war largely through taxes. Uh, the income taxes were raised to huge levels. Uh, among the wealthy, they were essentially uh, extortionate levels, just completely taking their entire income. And for most Americans, it was a very large tax increase. We funded about half the cost of the war with higher taxes. The other half was, in effect, taxes. It was really forced borrowing. Uh, we had the war bonds drive, and people could voluntarily choose to buy the bonds or not, but there was nothing else to spend the money on. All staples and foods and stuff were strictly rationed, and no large-scale consumer goods were available. So people bought bonds. Our savings rate rose from a norm of about 2.5% to over 17%, a level without any precedent before or since in our history. And as a result, we won the war. An interesting look at the steps taken during the wartime economy. When we return, how the British kept German spies out of England. A date which will live in infamy. will live in infamy. Thank you for staying with us. Now, when the British broke the Enigma Code, it hindered Germany's ability to infiltrate England. Here's Dick Morris with more. It led to what was called the double cross system in World War II. What the British did was they were intercepting the German code. They would hear everything the Germans were saying. And when the Germans were sending a spy to Britain, they would radio their contacts on the ground and say, the spy is going to be parachuted at this time, in this field, in this place. Please be there to meet him and take him in and get him oriented. Uh, and then we'll release him and he can be a spy in Britain for us. Well, the Ger British were listening. And in fact, they, there were no German agents in Britain. They'd rounded them all up. And when the spy came in, the British police were standing right there, or the troops, and arrested him the minute the parachute hit the ground. And they'd take him to prison, and they'd lock him away till the end of the war, and then a British intelligence officer would be appointed to be him. And he would then say, yeah, I'm here, I'm here, I'm all welcomed by the collie comrades, and I'm ready to go around and serve the fatherland and all of that. And the British would, the Germans would say, well, 
give us this information, get us that information. And the British would usually helpfully comply uh, because it was more important to them to have the Germans believe the spies were there than not to give them the information. So for the entire course of World War II, there was not a single German spy in Britain. And Hitler thought there were hundreds of them, and they were all being run by British intelligence. Isn't that incredible? Now, once this led to a terribly, terribly difficult and tragic moment for Winston Churchill, one of the most tragic in his entire life, the Germans decided to bomb the city of Coventry, and they telegraphed their spies. They'll black out the city at night, because all the British cities were blacked out during the Blitz. We want you to light the way to it, and then light up enough lights in Coventry so we can find it and we can bomb it. So Churchill got this, and what's he supposed to do? He had three courses of action open to him. One is he could say, here it is, and let them bomb Coventry and protect that the code was secret. The other is he could evacuate Coventry, but he'd never keep it secret. They would find out, and they'd know they was messing with the code. Or he could track them to the wrong place and have them drop the bombs in an empty field, but then they wouldn't read in the newspaper about the horrific raid on Coventry. And they'd get the point also that the code was compromised. And Churchill said, I don't know, care what the price is, I have got to pay it because I can't let the fact that we've compromised this code get out. It's the key to D-Day and to the landings in France. I can't let that happen. So he instructed the British intelligence to guide the German aircraft in and show them where Coventry was. And 10,000 people died in that air raid. And he had absolutely no choice. He had to do it. Absolutely tragic. Another fascinating look at the critical steps taken to defeat Germany. Now, when we come back, Dick Morris examines how the U.S. became a great industrial giant during the war. A thing which will live in infamy. which will live in infamy. Welcome back. In our next segment, Dick Morris explains how entering the war made the U.S. an industrial behemoth. How did America gear up for World War II industrially? How did we manage to produce this machine, this industrial machine that won the war? That's what we'll talk about in today's history video. This is all based on a very interesting book that I just finished at this year called Freedom's Forge, F-O-R-G-E, by Arthur Herman. Uh, just a terrific book. And it really explains how the United States acquired this industrial domination in World War II. Uh, before the war, our industries were in terrible shape. Uh, steel, for example, we'd produced 60 million tons of it in 1929, and in 1939, we produced only 30 million. Our armaments industry had completely tanked, a deliberate effort by the pacifists who controlled Congress and wanted to cripple the arms industry. And we really had very little industrial capacity of the sort that we had, in, that, that we had during the war. And what happened was that it built up over a two or three year period to this behemoth that dominated the world. And to give you an idea, the United States in 1944 produced 100,000 airplanes. This, that was number one in the world. Number two in the world was Germany at 8,500. <laughs> that gives you an idea of the unbelievable domination of uh, the war by American materiel. Um, we produced a car for every uh, vehicle, for every two American soldiers, whereas the Wehrmacht was using horse-drawn transport in 1943 and 44. How did this happen? Well, the left has rewritten history, Herman writes. The left has said that it was central planning, it was the result of the government ordering people to do different things, and a really a testament to the effectiveness of a socialist system. And that turns out to be just totally wrong. It's completely rewriting history. John Kenneth Galbraith, who was one of the leading liberal historians and economists who worked at the Office of Price Management and worked on the, uh, the process, dismissed the dollar-a-year men, the industrialists, who came to Washington and volunteered their time to win the war uh, as worth a dollar a year. It's a quote of his. Harold Ickes and Eleanor Roosevelt and the Lip Henry Wallace, the communist who was vice president 
uh, all of them got together and told Roosevelt, we have to win the war. And this is the ideal opportunity for us to show socialism in action. Uh, you should mobilize the war industries, appoint a czar who can, you know, one of Obama's czars, and he can allocate equip material and equipment and transportation and rolling stock as he wishes, and uh, really will, will be a miracle of production. And Roosevelt said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to rely on private enterprise to do it. And he brought in a guy named Bill Knudsen, K-N-U-D-S-O-N. I'm still not sure if he pronounces it Knudsen or Knudsen, but maybe one of the watchers can keep inform me about that. Uh, he had been the head of Ford Motors along with Henry Ford, and then he moved over to GM and really created Chevrolet and uh, made GM number one in the country. He left his post in 1939, early 1940, and moved to Washington for a dollar a year and set about converting the economy. And his concept was total capitalism. Create incentives, give contracts where you'll make money, give workers wages where they'll make money, and let the desire for profit motivate American industry to move ahead and leave the decisions as to how to do it and who should make what and how they should fit into the system to the individual businessmen themselves. Uh, it's too complicated for the government to do it. He pointed out that GM had like 12,000 subcontractors. He couldn't go around telling each one, okay, you used to make drive shafts, now you're going to make a turret for a tank, or you used to make tires, now you're going to make treads just too complex, too complex. Instead, put a pot of money out there and get them interested in getting a piece of it and pr setting production targets that you get them to reach. And as a result, uh, war industry profits were very significant during the war, but at the same time, wages rose a real 80% during the war. Uh, and all of that produced this gigantic industrial machine. And the book goes through the details of how that happened. Um, particularly, for example, the difficulty of making a B-29 bomber, uh, which had a wingspan of 300 feet, and uh, the difficulty of converting the automobile industry to making tanks, and uh, all of the challenges of ramping up aluminum production, ramping up magnesium production, all of the stuff that they went through. But the theme that underlies it is that it was the private sector, voluntary initiative, by businessmen and by labor pursuing the goal of profit. By the way, the role of labor unions during the war was outrageous. There were strikes at every venture, every cross, uh, inhibiting rearmament, inhibiting preparedness, and then once the war started, they didn't stop. In 1943, John L. Lewis, the head of the mine workers, announced all 60,000 mine workers were going to go on strike for higher wages, right smack in the middle of the war. And um, Roosevelt had to threaten to pull the draft deferments of all of the miners and draft them into the army and order them to continue. Uh, and uh, Lewis backed down, but only after enormous public anger and outrage at him. But this is a fascinating history. And what really happened was, it's kind of a limited statement to say that we pr the industrial stuff won the war. What it did was it positioned the United States to be the dominant industrial power in the world because we had this vast capacity. And after the war, a lot of the planners said, oh, we have to scale back now because we'll never have enough people buying all of these products. Uh, and if we, put, put, if we attempt to do it, we're going to have inflation, we're going to have high unemployment, we'll go right back to the days of the Depression. And the American industry said, no way. You let us keep our capacity. We'll keep these factories going. And we'll fill it out, making refrigerators and cars and all manner of consumer appliances. And when the soldiers came home, they had huge savings that they'd amassed during the war because he didn't spend anything over there. And as a result, the huge demand flooded the market and uh, products flooded the market. We had a brief flurry of inflation in late 45 and early 46. But after that, things hummed along normally and it was the boom of the 40s and the 50s that made the United States the dominant power that it is today. And in the process really created the basis of what the left calls, and Eisenhower called, the military industrial complex. It's a fascinating read, Freedom's Forge by Arthur Herman. And thanks for watching. Stay tuned to Newsmax TV for more insight into how America was shaped by history. This has been Looking Back with Dick Morris. I'm John Bachman. Thanks for watching.